Welcome everyone to our Your Child's Health University presentation this evening. I'm Nancy Sanchez from Community Health Education Programs, and it's my great pleasure to present um, our speaker this evening, who is Dr. John Mark. He's going to be speaking with us on integrative medicine and children. It's a fascinating subject. A little bit about Dr. Mark. Uh, Dr. Mark uh, received his medical degree from the University of Kansas and he completed a residency in pediatrics at Children's Mercy, University of Missouri in Kansas City. He continued his training in pediatric pulmonary medicine uh, during his fellowship at the University of Rochester, Rochester, New York. And then in 1999, he went to the University of Arizona to complete the first fellowship in pediatric integrative medicine, um, and uh, that was funded by the National Institute of Health. He's now on faculty at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at, uh, since, uh, since 2005, and he has been utilizing different complementary and alternative healthcare practices with his patients with chronic pulmonary illnesses, asthma, cystic fibrosis. His interest is in nutrition, mind-body approach to healing, and trying to minimize medication and uh, emphasis on such things as exercise. Very fascinating subject, and we thank you, Dr. Mark, for being here this evening. Thank you. When I uh, first got into academic medicine after I left my fellowship at the University of Rochester, I came out to California and took a position at UC Davis in uh, Sacramento. And I, after about two years of uh, being in uh, academic medicine, I uh, discovered that it wasn't really for me. I mean, it was, it was like research and it wasn't like very holistic and not very caring. And plus I met my now wife who wanted to live in Santa Cruz. So I left academic medicine and moved to Santa Cruz. And for the next 15 years, I learned mostly about how to care for uh, children uh, through non-conventional ways, because about everybody in the Central Coast uses everything but medicine. They'd only come to see the doctor if, they, if their acupuncture didn't work, if their homeopathy didn't work, if their mind-body stuff didn't work. And so they were teaching me, really, over those next 15 years. And so in 1999, uh, I was uh, fortunate to uh, find an offer for a fellowship at the University of Arizona, and they got a, what was called a center grant, where they, for the next five years, were actually going to study uh, alternative therapies in children. And so I applied, just on a, kind of on a whim, and I got accepted to be a fellow down there. And what was really nice is that many of you heard of Andrew Weil, who was kind of the guru in, in, in integrative medicine. He was at the University of Arizona for a long time. And he had an ongoing program that was a clinical program, what they call a residential fellowship, but there was no pediatric part of it. And so we went down, I went down there, and thinking that I'd be down there for two years just doing research. And, uh, but I actually, they kind of adopted us into their program. So then we got to hang out with, with uh, Dr. Weil and all his group in the, for the next two years. And you know, we would spend the day with Deepak Chopra or the day with Patch Adams, and we would learn all these different therapies. And we really got to know a lot about the different types of um, uh, alternative therapies. And plus, I was doing research too. And a couple of the topics that I looked at was the use of echinacea in children one to five years of age who had recurrent or persistent otitis media. And uh, we also looked at uh, mind body relaxation in children with recurrent abdominal pain. And we also looked at uh, chamomile tea with kids with abdominal pain. And one of the interesting ones that we did was we looked at acupuncture and massage therapy in children with cerebral palsy to see if we could actually decrease their spasticity. So we were doing all those research. At the same time, we got to be part of all the integrative therapies and go to all the clinics and listen to all the lectures and those things. So I thought, well, after two years of being at the University of Arizona, that's why I still have the, the U of A up there, is that I would come back down to Santa Cruz and I would never have to practice in academic centers again. But then I kind of got lured back into academics when I was at the U of A. Because if maybe many of you know, the University of Arizona has a long history of having an excellent respiratory therapy and, and respiratory, both pediatrics and adult medicine. So I started hanging out with those guys. And when I finished my fellowship, they asked me if I wanted to be one of their staff on, on the faculty. So I went back to academic medicine after being gone for all those 15 years and started being a practicing pediatric pulmonary person again and using all these alternative therapies, integrated them into the conventional therapies, the so-called integrative medicine. And after being down there for another four years, I wanted to come back to the Central Coast because that's where I wanted to be, and I came back to Stanford in 2005. So uh, that's kind of my long journey, I actually, was out of academic medicine, kind of got into it by actually going back in and learning about alternative therapies and complementary medicine, which we now call integrated medicine. And so that's kind of how I got interested in it. And so since being back here, we're trying to use it more and more in the patients that I see, especially with chronic illnesses, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And I, just, I was just telling Nancy that I just came from a meeting where we're actually trying to set up an outpatient integrated medicine surface here at Packard. And we're trying to work on that for the next, hopefully the next fiscal year, which starts in this September, where we actually have outpatient clinics in rheumatology, GI, infectious disease, pulmonary, and pain, all kind of working together in different ways, and not just using conventional therapies. So that's kind of the background to, for tonight. So I think we're moving along. It's taken me a while, but 
if you know Stanford or Packard very well, everything takes a long time. You just have to be really persistent, which I am. And uh, so we were just kind of working this along. So you might ask about what is CAM is what sometimes people refer to as complementary medicine. And what is the prevalence? In 2007, you can see adults spend almost uh, $34 billion, billion dollars, out of pocket to visit practitioners to purchase some different products. So it's huge. It's a huge industry out there. If you ever walked into a health food store and you're saying like, oh, I heard echinacea helps you with if you get a cold to help it decrease the severity and duration, walk into it and try and figure out what kind of echinacea to take. There's a whole wall of echinacea. You know, how do you have any idea that it's such a big thing, it's such a big industry? Nearly two-thirds of the total out-of-pocket cost by adults were for self-care products. And so people are really trying to stay healthy. They're actually trying to do things to avoid going to physicians and going to emergency rooms and going to urgent care. And what can I do to help promote my own self-care? And despite the emphasis on self-care therapies, there's still 38.1 million adults made over 350 million visits to practitioners of alternative medicine. So that's your, that's your acupuncturist, that's your homeopathic physicians, that's your osteopathic person who does, does uh, therapeutic massage. You have all these different people that are doing all these different techniques. So this just gives you an idea. This is from an NIH report trying to show you what the CAM use is. And you can see that the, the United States, this is the percent of the population, about 42% of the population. It's not as high as someplace like Canada, which is up to 70%, which is really amazing. And then in the developing world, really, we always talk about conventional medicine really is the alternative medicine in most conventional uh, countries and in, 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 in non-industrial ones because really this is what they practice and we don't want to use conventional medicine on the side. But you can see like in Ethiopia and stuff, it's like it's uh, up to almost uh, 90%. And then one of the, I put this little figure in here because even though people think that they want to do self-care, you know, it's a lot harder to really do good nutrition. It's hard to do lifestyle. It's hard to do exercise. It's either just to take a pill. So if you can go to the health food store and just take a pill, it's more conventional. It's more natural. It's dietary supplements, which one of the things I actually want to talk about tonight, but it's actually the most conventional-like. So it's one of the things that kind of bothers me about, quote, alternative medicine because a lot of people really rely on dietary supplements and it's actually my least favorite thing to talk about because it's the one that's most conventional if you get by drift. You know, so instead of trying to be healthy, it's like I'll just go get another bottle and even though it's supposed to be natural, I'll just take this medication. And again, this one you can see can be used by adults and children. In, in 2007, it was, uh, this is all children, so this is not just children with chronic disease, which goes, if you look at children with chronic disease, it actually goes up to 50, 60, even 80 percent in some studies, but in overall children, it's still about 12 percent. And then one of the things you can see here is that 14.8 billion were in non-vitamin, non-mineral natural products. So there's your dietary supplements. It's a huge, huge industry. So really dietary supplements are, and, and natural products are still the thing that people use the most. You can see there's a little bit we're going to talk about is there's a, almost $3 billion in homeopathic. You can see there's a, a, they call it yoga here. And then there's all the practitioner's costs. And you can see that about only $0.2 billion in that re relaxation techniques. And actually relaxation techniques and mind-body therapies, which we'll talk about, are actually one of the, one of the leading causes that actually showed there's some evidence behind it. Yes? What does nutrition fit in? So nutrition actually doesn't really, they didn't really count that as being alternative. And that's why it didn't really fit in. There is, I mean, it's like, what is really alternative medicine in a way? It is, if you take 250 milligrams of vitamin C, that's, that's considered to be the standard. How about if you take a gram of vitamin C? Well, that's a little bit more. How about if you take six grams every day of vitamin C? Well, then all of a sudden now you're into complementary alternative medicine and dietary supplements. So it's a fine line. So what is diet? I mean, you see a lot of children who have chronic illnesses, they do lots of different types of diets. So when do you make it so it's not really just nutrition and when is it really type of alternative therapies? So it's hard to really sort out. So that's why these studies are hard to do. If you look at ethnicity, you can see that actually Native American and, uh, and, and Alaskan Natives are actually over 50% as, as you go down, but Hispanic and actually Afro-Americans are the two lowest in Asians. But again, a lot of these studies depends on what they ask. You know, what do they mean by alternative therapies? So really, how about in children? So about 8 million individuals younger than 18 years of age, according to this uh, pediatric article that just came out uh, now two years ago, used alternative medicine in 2007. Adolescents and children living in the West, like California, those with parents with 12 years of education and prescription medication use were independently associated with overall increased CAM use. So the more educated they were and the more that the parents used alternative therapies, the more the kids tend to use it too. Common medical conditions included GI problems, anxiety, stress, skin issues, insomnia, muscle skeletal conditions, especially fatigue, uh, sinusitis were, were increased with CAM use. Uh, parental CAM use was a strong correlate of child CAM use. And many studies have found that the higher CAM use among children with chronic conditions like asthma, ADHD, autism, food allergies, uh, arthritis, type 1 diabetes, and sickle cell were actually the highest. So if you, the more chronic you got, the more they tended to go up. So why do the people use these? I mean, why don't they just go to the doctor and get their normal care? Well, therapies are consistent with the patient's and family's values, which is, you know, 
what they believe in. So that's really what they want to use. And a lot of times it has to do with what your grandmother used, your auntie used, whether it was traditional in your family and, and, and lifestyle. And it's really natural, ecological, and maybe even empowering because you're deciding what you're going to take. It's not just when you go to the doctor or you go to the physician or you go to the healthcare clinic and they say, take this medicine, take this medicine, take this medicine. But it's like, well, I'm trying to make a decision as to what makes the best decisions for myself. The CAM providers are felt to be more patient-centered. So we talk, we talk about being about uh, high-touch, low-tech because, you know, we go to see physicians. A lot of times they only spend like 30, it seems like 30 seconds with you. They listen one, two, uh, out the door. They charge you a lot of money. But if you actually go into an alternative medicine practitioner, sometimes it's an hour, hour and a half, two hours. They really get a detailed history. There may be hands-on therapy if you're doing massage or osteopathic manipulation or even chiropractor. It's all very kind of a high touch, which people really find very soothing and actually very healing. And it is for a lot of families. And that makes a tremendous difference. So it tends to be much more patient-centered. Conventional therapies are perceived to be emotionally or spiritually without benefit. That sounds funny, but it's really true. I mean, if you go, you just get another pill or another inhaler or whatever kind of therapy you get, it's not very spiritual. I mean, it doesn't feel like there's much that you're going to get out of it emotionally. And conventional therapy is associated with side effects and significant risk in some conditions. So even the medicines I use for common asthma, we always talk about all the risks that are involved with it. And if you see the ones on TV, like for Advair or one of those combinations, they're saying, oh, yeah, you can play, you can run, you do a thing. And then they have that little disclaimer at the end where they talk really fast and really slow where they say, of course, there's an increased risk of death, and there's an increased side effects, there's an increased blah, 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 and it's all over. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, did they say something about death? <laughs> and so it's like, why would I want to ever take this medicine that has an increased risk of death with this condition? And it's also a circular process, and this is really, really important in California. If there's a lot of alternative practitioners, then there's a lot of alternative practice use. And they did a, a nice study in, in uh, England where they had one children's hospital that had a lot of practitioners around that did alternative therapies, another one that didn't have very much, and where they didn't have very many, they didn't use very much. Where they had a lot, they used a lot. So again, it tends to be more circular. So if you have people available, you tend to use it more often. And then you can say, what is, I keep mentioning these back and forth, but then I want to make the distinction about what is CAM or complementary alternative medicine and what's integrated medicine. So really, complementary alternative medicine, according to the NIH, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, is a group of diverse products and healthcare systems, practices and products, not considered to be part of conventional medicine, which is kind of interesting because over the last 10, 15, 20 years, things that were at one time not considered to be conventional now are conventional. So now they're no longer CAM anymore. Now they're like, oh yeah, we do that. Oh yeah, now it's okay to take you know, uh, certain things if you have diabetes. It's okay if you take certain things if you have heart disease. But even 15, 20 years ago, it was considered to be alternative. Some scientific evidence exists regarding CAM therapies for some. Uh, for most, actually, there's still a lot of questions regarding safety and efficacy because they haven't gone through randomized controlled trials. They're not, quote, evidence-based. And I'll mention that a little bit later because a lot of things we do in conventional medicine aren't too evidence-based either. But since we're taught about them in medical school and that's what's practiced in our, in our lives, that's, they're okay. But the, what tends to be not taught in medical schools or not what's taught to us tends to be kind of more alternative. Integrated medicine actually is what we try to practice and what I was promoted when I was at the University of Arizona. And it really combines mainstream medical therapies and these different types of complementary therapies for which there is some high quality scientific evidence of safety and effectiveness. So you try to take the best of both worlds and you try to make it. So if I have a child that has asthma, I'll say, I'm going to give you this medicine and this medicine. I'm going to try to get rid of the cat out of the hospital. I'm going to try to get the, the dad to quit smoking in the house. I'm going to do all these environmental things. And then over the next six or, or 12 months, I'm going to improve your nutrition, I'm going to help your lifestyle, I'm going to get you to exercise again. Maybe we're going to start you on some dietary supplements that have been shown to be more effective and not have, at least have less side effects than some of the medicines you're taking, and try to do a mix of try to, how can you get the best therapies for the least amount of medications and it really changes the whole, the whole patient's and the family's life. So a couple of jokes just to break it up here. You can see 100% natural remedies. Some pure snake oil. And I think that's, a, that's a one thing I'll keep mentioning over and over again is that dietary supplements aren't regulated very well. You're really a, you don't know what's in almost any product that you pick up on the shelf unless you really have a good seal of approval, so you really don't know. This is herbal remedies versus verbal remedies. I kind of like this, so this kind of fits in my talk tonight, which is dietary supplements versus mind-body, right? And so sometimes I think the mind-body, the verbal remedies are actually better. Snap out of it. And you can see here, the truth is, doctor, I've lost faith in Western medicine, which is uh, appropriate for being in California. So what are the major classes of CAM with the complementary medicine? Again, I use this because this is what the NIH uses, the National Institutes of Health. So they have a National Center for Complementary Medicine. They broke it kind of a little bit spuriously, but they broke it into five categories, which makes it easier to talk about. The first one, which I'm not going to talk about in detail, is alternative medical systems, homeopathy, naturopathic, traditional Chinese, and Ayurvedic treatments. These are systems that are completely different than conventional therapies. This is not 
You're not gonna just take a medicine because you have an ear infection, so you take 10 days of antibiotics and you get over it. This is actually approaching medicine in a different way, and I'll mention why that is. It has to do more with keeping your life in balance and not going after a specific symptom. The one that we are gonna talk about is mind-body intervention, which is actually my favorite one because I think there's very little side effects in using the, the person to really think about and how they can control their illness and how they can control their chronic conditions and even their acute conditions. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as the night goes on, but it enhances the mind's capacity to affect bodily function and symptoms. I just talked to one of my nurses today and she thought, she goes, you know I'm gonna sound crazy. I said, what do you mean? She goes, I'm gonna to go to a hyp hypno hypnotic uh, uh, practice where they're gonna do virtual uh, labs bands. So instead of getting the, for obesity, instead of getting your stomach banded, she's gonna actually go to a, uh, uh, get hypnosis to get virtual bands placed so she'll feel full before she actually is full so then she won't eat and she doesn't have to go through the surgery. And it sounds, she goes, you think that sounds crazy? I said, no, it sounds perfectly logical to me because you can do that type of thing. You can really get your mind to change your way that you think about how you feel. And that actually can promote health more than actually having the actual surgery. So if you, but you have to be the right person. You have to have that kind of mindset to be able to do that. You have to be kind of accepting. The, the mind's capacity, and actually it's almost not even considered to be alternative medicine anymore because really the, most of the research that's been done over the last 50 years has been in this area. And it's almost been all very positive. The one I'm reluctant to talk about, but I have to because you saw how many people spend all these billions of dollars using are biologically based therapies, the dietary supplements, the herbs, the foods, the vitamins, the natural substances. And again, this is kind of a big quagmire of everything. And we'll talk about some that are very recently thought out. Some actually have very good scientific evidence behind it. And I'll mention a couple of those studies. And some are just people that are just nuts trying to make a lot of money. So it has, it has a full range of when you talk about dietary supplements. The last one is, uh, I mean, the, the fourth one is manipulative and body-based therapies like chiropractic, osteopathy, and massage. And we'll talk a little bit more of that. Again, massage is another one that's been a lot of press lately, and the National Institutes of Health and the National Center for Complementary Medicine now have, have now over two and a half million dollars in studies just based on massage right now in the United States. And the last one is the one that's a little bit further out there, just like it is with alternative medicine. These are all the energy therapies. This is the biofield therapies, the bioelectronic mag magnetic therapies. So if you think about, you know, this is about, you know, this goes all the way back to the 1700s where people tried to say, if you just could figure out your magnetic waves, you could really make people better. If you think about, you have EMGs that do your muscles, you have EKGs that do your heart, you have EOGs that do your eyes, you have EEGs, you have all these things, all your body is just really electric all the time. So it seems like if you could just try to coordinate all this electricity and all that stuff to kind of flow in the right way, it would make a big difference. And Mesner was this guy back in the 1700s in France, you know, who used to put people in bathtubs and put surrounded with magnets and you know he wore this big hat with a cone on it you know and he actually they tried to uh, they tried to ostracize him and Ben Franklin was brought from the United States over there to, to put him on trial and say he was a quack and they had all these things about having sap go up in trees and he could feel it and it was really this goes back hundreds and hundreds of years now this whole thought about trying to really uh, do magnetic therapy and you think about it, you still see it you still see people who put you know magnets in their in their shoes and magnets in their beds and try to hit the back pain, and there are arthritis, and there's all these things that go along with magnet therapy. And so again, there's a lot to do with that, but it's, as you can imagine, it'd be very hard to study. So what are a couple examples of alternative medical systems? Well, there's homeopathic medicine, and this is a belief that likes cure likes, which is very different from what we do. We give aspirin for a fever, or Tylenol for a fever, to bring it down. But if you're in homeopathic medicine, you'd actually give something that would cause the fever, but you just give it in very, very small amounts. So that's where you get the idea that likes cure likes, so the law of similars. So they actually went through thousands of hundreds of thousands of different remedies to find out what caused certain conditions. And then they would just give you very small amounts of it and that's what would make it better. So it's a very different, that's why it's alternative. It's like, it's very hard for people to kind of grasp it. That's why people always say, if you give such a small amount, oh, don't worry about it, it's a homeopathic dose because it's so tiny a dose. And uh, they're all given, if you're given at the higher or more concentrated doses, they actually would cause those symptoms. So the notation, if you've ever seen a homeopathic, I'll show it to you, 6X means that the active substance so say we take something like sulfur and then we have a 6X after it. That means that it's been dilated, diluted one to 10 in our water alcohol mixture in success, which is shook, shaken. And this procedure, diluting and successing, is repeated sequentially six times. So then you have one part in a million for a notation that's times six. So that's why people are saying like, oh, don't worry about it, it's homeopathic, because there's hardly anything in there. The thing you have to remember though about homeopathic is not the law of similars, but also the least concentrated it is we're to the point where there's not even one molecule in there, that's actually the strongest. So that's, that's, that's the law of dilution. That's why people really think it's nonsense, because if it's so diluted, how could it actually have anything in there? 
And that's where it kind of switches over to kind of more energy medicine because there's a memory in the water that when you did that shaking, that somehow that thing got the memory into the whatever you're taking. And when you take that pill or you take that little thing under your tongue, that actually is very effective. And, this, and the more diluted it is, the stronger it is. So you can see that people, especially in conventionally trained, are thinking like homeopathy, that's crazy. There's naturopathic medicine or naturopathy, and there's actually three or four different schools in the United States that actually put out naturopathic uh, physicians. And this is a great group of people if you ever run into a really good naturopath, because you can see here, they believe in the power of the body, maintains and restores health. They use nutrition, lifestyle counseling, supplements, homeopathy, and Chinese medicine. So they kind of practice everything that allopathic medicine doesn't do. So if you ever hook up with a good naturopath and you're the conventional trained doctor, you have the balance almost of everything. So they're actually good, they can be very good, uh, very good counterparts. And Bastyr is kind of the famous university and they have a lot of, of uh, collaboration with the University of Washington in Seattle. Bastyr, B-A-S-T-Y-R. And then there's traditional Chinese medicine. And again, I'm not, I just want to show you what these different alternative medicines are. We're not going to talk, these are all lectures in themselves as you can imagine. But that's the belief in the unseen vital energy that affects the, uh, the health and how this energy or chi kind of flows up and down your body. And that's what acupuncture, acupressure does. The thing you have to remember about traditional Chinese medicine, it's not just acupressure or acupuncture. It also has to do with herbal remedies, has to do with nutrition, has to do with martial arts, has to do with five different things really that really all work together. So people think about traditional Chinese medicine as just being acupuncture, but it's actually acupuncture, but a bunch of a lot of other things. And actually the herbal remedies in Chinese medicine is what's getting a lot of press right now. And last week there were the big the allergy meetings in Florida, the Quad AI they call them, and there was a lot of uh, uh, reporting on some of the Chinese herbal mixtures showing that they really work and very effective in different uh, animal models for allergies and eczema. And so it looks like there's a lot of Im immunomodulary type things that work with Chinese medicine. We'll talk a little bit more about it when we get to the herbal uh, remedies and dietary supplements. But they don't just use one herb, they usually use five or ten herbs and they have them mixed in a certain grade, they, they have gradations where there's one that's very strong and the one that's very weak and they kind of have have like a little soldier, like they all kind of march together. So here's just an example of one that I like, it's called Flu Plus. This is one that, hmm, I wonder what you use this for. Uh, so this is, you know, you're supposed to be in dietary supplements, you're supposed to not say that you cure or treat anything, but you always enhance health. Well, this one enhances you not to have the flu. And so you can see that it has uh, four times, and now you all know what that 4X means now, it's been six times four, one to 10. This one you can see is one to a million. Actually, that's Epicac. You know, all know what Epicac is. It makes you vomit if you take a poison. Uh, Pulsatilla, here's a little mercury, here's a little phosphorus, here's a little sulfur. Here's a little last year's influenza that's 12 times. So that's like one in a billion pieces. So you're not too worried about you're gonna to get too sick from that. One in a billion, which is more than even one molecule would be in the fluid. And you can see here's my favorite. Bushmaster snake venom, there he is right there. It's also uh, one to 12 times X. And so you can see, and this is a mixture of what they call, what they call uh, uh, not the, uh, more clinical homeopathy. If you actually went to a classical homeopathic physician, they would never give you this mixture because this is, this is a whole bunch of stuff they just throw together. They would actually get your symptom, your flu, and they really try to categorize it to the one thing that would work the most, and they would give you one at most, maybe two remedies. And they would actually give you a not too diluted one, because that, remember, that's too strong. And then as you got better, they would give you more diluted ones, which are stronger. So again, it's an interesting way of approaching things. But this is what most people tend to, to buy in the stores now, which is a mixture of all these different homeopathic remedies. How about energy therapies? Well, they involve energy fields. There are usually two types. The biofield therapies are intended to affect energy fields. This is like Qigong, Reiki. A lot of nurses use this, so you think about therapeutic touch or, or a natural touch. And this is try to, again, try to get your energy in the right way to open up your chakras, to get your things to flow up and down and really improve. If you've ever seen a, a good uh, Qigong or Reiki therapist, it's pretty amazing. I mean, I just watched somebody actually make somebody's migraine headache go away right in front of me. I mean, she went from being nauseated in sunglasses to be able to have a full meal right there within 10 minutes in front of us. So again, that's just what woman just was standing over, never touching her, but just trying to move her energy around. So it's, it's, she, yeah, she did a Reiki method. Bioelectronic energy is what I talked about a little bit earlier, electromagnetic fields such as pulse fields, magnetic fields, or alternating current or direct current fields. And again, this is all this idea that you have all this energy running through you. If you just try to figure out how to get your EKGs, your EMGs, your EEGs all to work together, you can imagine you should, be, should feel a lot better because there should be some kind of disconnect if you're not doing well. So let's go on to, uh, uh, the last one is uh, manipulative body-based therapies. 
And most people think about chiropractors being one, which is focuses on the relationship between bodily structure of the spine and the function. That's where the kind of the high velocity, low amplitude, that's when you get cracked, right? And that's why you, you usually do a lot of uh, different therapies for that. Osteopathic manipulation actually emphasizes diseases arising from the muscle, muscle skeletal system. The body systems work together in disturbances in one system. But people don't realize this, but there's six major categories of osteopathic manipulation with over 100 different techniques. So in the 60s and 70s, most osteopaths kind of quit learning about osteopathic manipulation. They kind of became more, quote, conventional doctors. And now it's making a big comeback. And even in Santa Cruz, Monterey, Salinas area, there's osteopathic physicians who don't do any conventional therapies. All they do is manipulation. And they do craniosacral. They do the, the high velocity, low amplitude ones, like the, the cracking the back. They, they do uh, different types of uh, lymphatic drainage. They do muscle skeletal. They do uh, pressure points. They have all these different ones that they do. And, and some of these places, like when I was uh, giving a talk uh, uh, last year at uh, Barbara Bush Children's Hospital in Portland, they had a lot of osteopathic manipulators going right on in their inpatient, even in the ED. So they, some hospitals, especially in the Midwest and the East Coast, have really embraced osteopathic manipulation as being an acute therapies. And massage therapists manipulate muscles and connective tissue to enhance function of those tissues to promote relaxation and well-being. And there's been quite a few studies actually supporting the use of that as well. So now let's move to research. There's been multiple studies showing the most popular treatments are dietary supplements, much to my chagrin. There's evidence lacking even for the most popular ones even in adults. And the Institutes of Medicine saying that the same principles and standards of evidence of treatment effectiveness apply to all treatments, whether currently labeled as conventional medicine or CAM. So really, if you're going to use something, it really should have some type of evidence to support its use. It maybe doesn't have to be a large randomized controlled trial like you do for drugs, but it has to be some type of evidence where you actually tried to study it and show. And sometimes it could be historical, sometimes it could be traditional, but most of the time they really, the Institutes of Medicine would like to have some type of research. And there's very few uh, studies that have done very well in part because they're not very well funded, which is another whole story. So funding and research is growing, but still relatively small for totals. If you look at some of the uh, studies that you look at uh, that have shown to be effective, here are the ones, this is from Archives of Disease and Ch Childhood article about six years ago. And they, they thought this were well documented now, that biofeedback for constipation and headache, hypnotherapy for headache and irritable bowel syndrome. So you can see mind bodies are really embraced and they really felt to be part of the almost standard protocols now. Uh, lemon balm for herpes simplex, massage for constipation. These are all ones that have enough studies that people now can say these really work. These are uncertain. Maybe acupuncture for asthma, acupuncture for hay fever, for rheumatoid arthritis. Chromium for diabetes was a big one in the 60s and 70s and even up into the 90s. It's just like if you just give enough chromium, a lot of diabetes will get better. Now cinnamon is one that's taken over for a lot of diabetes. Echinacea for the common cold, evening primrose. And unlikely is some for acupuncture that you can see over there for smoking and for weight reduction. Flower remedies for anxiety, homeopathy for anxiety. Again, these are very hard studies. You can imagine now, you just after I can give you my talk about what these are, how could you really study these in a large group of patients? Because everybody's so individualized. So again, but this is what they felt would be effective and not effective. How about use of supplements? Well, the alternative health supplements of the 2002 National Health Interview data on 10 common herbs. Of 30,000 adults, 19% used herbs in the past 12 months. And 57% of those, of that, of those uh, uh, 20%, which is a large amount, uh, used them for a specific condition. What was interesting is that approximately two out of the three used herbs, except for echinacea, was not even in accordance with the evidence-based ev indications. So they were going to health food stores, they were buying these different herbal remedies, and they were using them for different indications. Not even what was on the bottle in the health food stores. So again, even though it's really used, and, and it's really used commonly by a lot of adults especially, they don't even use it for what's commonly practiced in the health food store. So again, it's, a, it's a, kind of a really mixed bag. You can see why a lot of uh, families and, and uh, children don't really have a lot of direction because there's nobody really telling them about what to do. It's usually what your neighbor told you, your auntie told you, your grandmother told you, and you might try it just based on what you saw even in a newspaper or in a magazine article. So how about studies supporting conventional medicine? I always like to throw this slide in here just to remind people that uh, there was this nice article in Archives of Diseases of Children way back in 1999 where they did 240 consults and 1,149 clinical actions were performed. There was good evidence uh, was found by a randomized control trial or other appropriate for only 40% of the 629 uh, actions. So of all those ones in a hospital, they only 40% were using anything that was, quote, evidence-based. So that's why when people say, oh, you can't use these herbal remedies, you can't use these mind-body stuff, you can't use these energy medicines, these alternative therapies, because there's no research behind it, well, I can tell you that 40% of the time that what you do in the hospital doesn't have any evidence behind it either. And you can even see non-experimental was 7%, inconclusive for 25%. There was actually evidence of ineffectiveness for 0.2%, 
and no evidence at all for almost a third of them. So you can see that people are just like, oh, it makes sense to me, I'll just try it. And since I'm a doctor, there's evidence. But so that just shows you how the whole kind of mindset kind of happens, especially in the medical community. There was one even looking at surgery, interventions in a regional pediatric surgical unit. This is a, about as old. Of 281 patient interventions, 11% were based on controlled trials, and 66 were on non-convincing, non-experimental evidence. If you think about surgery, that's kind of how surgery developed. It's like, oh, I don't know if that kidney transplant will work. Let's just throw one in there and see what happens. And then after, you know, after a few 5, 10, 15 years, they actually tired to work. It's very hard to do a randomized controlled trial for something that is like a surgery. I mean, you can't say, well, I'm only going to take out half the appendix. You know, usually you're going to take it out, you're not going to take it out. So again, it's very hard to do these type of trials. But people give you all types of grief for not having good evidence for doing alternative medicine when a lot of the things that we do in conventional medicine doesn't have much evidence behind it either. So really, what you want to do is you want to figure out the parts. So there's all this alternative medicine, there's all this conventional Western medicine, and integrated medicine is trying to take the both parts. You want to use conventional West medicine that has the best side, of, that has the least amount of side effects, that's most effective, that has, that has the best uh, safety profile, and you want to take alternative therapies that have shown to have, be clinically effective, to be safe, and you want to marriage those two together. That's really the most important thing to do. And really, you have to bring in the patient's values because what the, you, know, you can say acupuncture, 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 but if the person does not want needles, it's not going to work. I'm sorry. It's just not going to make a difference. So you really have to bring in what they think, too. You have to look at the research. And you have to look at the clinical data. And hopefully, you'll come up with the optimal decision by trying to marry all those three together. So how about biologically-based therapies? Well, biologically-based therapies or dietary supplements are, are, are used in herbs, foods, and vitamins. They include all the dietary supplements, herbal products, and the use of so-called natural therapies. The Dietary uh, Supplement Health and Education Act, the Deshaies Act in 1994, this is what kind of threw everything into chaos. Uh, there was a, a Tom Harkin, uh, who was a senator from Iowa, and uh, I would just blank his name. What's the, the senator from Utah? Orrin Hatch. Now, you think that those guys don't have anything in common, right? One's very Republican and very right-wing, one's very liberal and very Democrat. But they got together and they wrote the Deshay Act because in Iowa and Utah are two of the hotbeds of dietary supplement where they're made. And they're saying, like, we don't want the FDA to regulate this stuff. These are really just natural substances. These are like foods. They should be regulated like foods. And so they wrote the Deshay Act in 1994, which acknowledges the potential health benefits of dietary supplements, which must contain vitamins, minerals, herbs, or botanicals, amino acids, or any combination of these may affect the structure or function of the body. So that flu plus is not really a very good name. I mean, they could actually get into trouble for calling it flu plus. But like if you have joint pain, you, you want, you'll have something like joint health. You can't say arthritis. If you have some type of like a liver, you can say liver health. You can't say hepatitis. You can say anything that will promote the health, but you can't say it will actually treat a disease. So that's where you get the distinction. So when you look at a dietary supplement, you should look. And if it makes the claim that it's going to treat or cure something, that's actually a red flag that maybe that's not a very good product. Because really, what they're supposed to do, the ones that really follow the law, are the ones that enhance the health in that area. They cannot claim, or, uh, claim to cure or treat a disease. They, that way, they don't need any new drug uh, application process, which is millions and millions of dollars, all that safety, all that animal data, all that lab data, all those trial one, two, three, all those have to do that. All you have to do is just put it in a pill and put it on the bottle and put it in the market, and you're good to go. There's no quality control. There's no good manufacturing standards enforced, and no oversight by the FDA. They actually changed that in 2007, but the FDA was never funded to actually make a difference. So actually, it's still not regulated. So you know, there's, I'll talk about it in a minute, but there's things you can do to try and figure out which ones are safe and which ones aren't safe. But right now, it's kind of chaos. The herbal industry at first didn't really care about this because they were selling everything off the, sh off the, off the, off the uh, uh, shelves. But in the late uh, uh, 1990s and early 2000s, they started to have more problems. Like you might remember there's kava kava causes some type of liver problem. There was this that, that St. John's wort caused problems with uh, people who had AIDS were taking HIV medications. So then they thought, oh my gosh, so people are really starting to, all their, their sales started to drop off. So now they're actually trying to, uh, uh, actually try to please themselves. So certain groups are actually trying to make some of their products much more safe and much more reliable. Here's the different approaches. I think this is actually one of my more important slides that I talk about dietary supplements. There's traditional use, like the Western approach. These are the folk medicinal tra traditions. This is like your teas, your tincture pulses. This is what your grandma might have taught you. This might be what your curandera might have taught you. This might be what your aunt or uncles used to take when they were in the old country or whatever that is. This is all the kind of the Western approach for folk medicine. And these don't have a lot of studies behind it, but they have thousands and hundreds of years of tradition behind them. So a lot of times, these are ones that have been very effective. There's indigenous use, Native American, Polynesian. A lot of times, these are drinks or even smoking of certain substances. 
There's Chinese and Ayurvedic. And again, I mentioned earlier, these are usually multiple herbs that they give it to you in a paper sack. You go home and you, and you, and you make it into a decoction or a tea. And usually they really smell awful and they really taste bad and they give you a, a bellyache and kids really hate them. But these are actually some of the ones that have the most research behind the show to be most effective. But they're hard for pediatrics because they don't taste very good. And there's homeopathy I talked about, which are tiny doses of mineral plants or even animal products like snake venom. Then over here is the non-traditional use, and this is based on theory. Like glutathione is, a, is an antioxidant. So these guys thought, well, you need antioxidants in your lungs, so let's just nebulize some to your lungs and let's treat cystic fibrosis with it. And they just made this whole thing up, and people just started using it all across the country. And it was written up in one of the women's, article, women's uh, magazines, and soon everybody was using it. In fact, to the point where the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation had to come out with a policy statement, because everybody just started using inhaled glutathione based on nothing, except that the theory that if you could take it orally, it must be good if you take it nebulized. Combination therapies, which I think is one that really drives me crazy, is that you'll find if you pick up a, a bottle of dietary supplements, you'll say, oh, there's a Chinese herb, oh, there's an Ayurvedic herb, oh, there's a Western herb, oh, there's a mineral, there's a vitamin, there's a diet. They just mix everything in there. So if you have something to do with joint pain, they'll take every tradition and they'll take a little bit of that herb and they'll put it in one capsule, charge you a lot of money for it, and say that it works. It, it makes no sense. Why would it work? You don't know what the interactions are. You don't know how they were going to do. So I always tell families and patients, that if you see something that has like lots of different things in it that come from lots of different backgrounds, that's not usually a very good dietary supplement to take. Is vitamins? Yeah, so vitamins is another one. You know, again, vitamins, is, like I said earlier, is like if you take a low dose, it's, it's supposed to be okay, but if you take higher dose, or you mix them in with a lot of things. So vitamins, no one really knows. The thing you have to be worried about vitamins is that sometimes you'll be taking one that, say, that has so many international units of vitamin A, then another one has so many international units of vitamin A. Then another one has so many units of vitamin A. It's kind of like acetaminophen. Pretty soon you're getting toxic on vitamin A because you're taking all these different herbal remedies that have it in it. So you really have to look at everything very carefully. Here's one I just liked on, on garlic. You can see here's, depending on the intended use by the manufacturer, garlic products are classified for regulatory purposes in one of eight categories. Conventional food, dietary supplement, food for special dietary uses, biological, drug, medical device, cosmetic, or food additive. So you can make garlic on about anything. You know, you can see that it helps all these different areas depending on how you take it. So garlic is one of these things that traditionally has been used for a very long time to help you with all kinds of things. But it kind of depends how it's marketed. You can could, you could see that's a, how, how it's either regulated or not regulated. So these are things that you can think. And again, I was going to mention this earlier, that anybody wants any of these slides, you can just, leave, you can just ask uh, uh, Nancy or Felicia are at the end, and they'll uh, they have their email addresses. They'll can send you by all the talks. But some of these are very nice to have. There's the, the National Center of Complementary Medicine. It's become a very good website in a lot of ways for definitions. It has some herbal remedies that you can look up, and it has some monographs. The Office of Dietary Supplements, MedWatch, CAM, which has to do with research, and the Canadian Health Dictoria. But the best one probably in this slide for government sites is the National Center for Alternative Medicine. There's academic sites. There's the Boston Longwood Herbal Task Force. This is actually a great one. This one has the, if you look up at Echinacea, it has all the animal studies, all the human studies. It has a monograph. It even has one that you can hand out to parents or one page, like this works, this doesn't work. So this is one that was done up at, uh, at uh, Boston Children's years ago. University of Pittsburgh, Beth Israel, Columbia, and even uh, Berkeley still has their good old wellness letter, which is still very, very effective and very nice, and they really try to keep it up to date. There's herbs and courses you can take, like the Dietary Supplements by Wake Forest. And this is one of my favorite ones I'll talk about, which is ConsumerLabs.com. And this is one that you actually have to prescribe, uh, uh, subscribe to. And then what it does, is every, every month it takes a commonly used dietary supplement. It takes like 15 to 20 popular brands, and it actually looks to see what's in them. So they're not paid by anybody. So, they, they, so you can look and say, and what you do is you start looking at that, you can start to get the ideas. Well, this, this company seems to be always spot on. This company seems to be always way off. So maybe I should start buying my herbal remedies from this company. So I can't really tell people what to buy anywhere because it's all so richly different. I mean, it's even different in Santa Cruz than it is in Palo Alto. So again, everybody depends on what you have, but this is actually a very good website. National Medicine Comprehensive Database is also a very good one. And this is one especially for medical types because this one really tells you about, all, it's like the PDA for herbal remedies and dietary supplements. So this tells you all the up-to-date studies that have ever been done on this different medication. And the same way for nutrition and dietary supplements. So if you go to the NCCAM uh, website, here's like this, I just took one of their pages and just put it on this paper. You can see like here's all these things you can click on to learn about, all these different ones you can see. So you hit on dietary supplements, here's all the E's and the G's and the H's. You can see there's the introduction to naturopathy. You can see what grapeseed extract, you can see what's new, past highlights, and you can subscribe to their newsletter and their e-bulletin, which is also very good. 
So when you do a resource evaluation, say you're going to a website, you're trying to figure out, is this a good website or is this not a good website? I always tell people, what's the introduction? Who runs the site? Who pays for the site? I mean, they're asking you for information. They're asking you for a credit card number. They ask you what your address is. They, is your computer pick up spyware when you go there? I mean, these are all things you want to know about. What's the purpose of the site? Is it to actually help you or is it to try to sell something to you? And how much advertisement is there? Where does the information come from? What's the basis of the information? Sometimes they'll say references, and you go look at the references, they're all like in 1966, and they're in China, and they all have to do with dogs. So that's probably not the best references for some of these. Some of them are very good. Some of them are right up to date. Some have been done locally. Some have been done at some of the, the uh, osteopathic or their, uh, the naturopathic colleges. How is the information selected? How current is it? Where does the site choose the links to other sites? You know, what does it kind of link you to? And what information about you does the site, uh, the site collect and why? So this is all from NCAM as to kind of how to resource whether a site is any good or not. And how does the site manage interactions with visitors? So it's Consumer Labs I mentioned. This is a nice one. It's a provider of independent test results and information to evaluate health, wellness, and nutrition products. They get about 200 million, two and a half million visits per year a certification. And actually, you can actually, on the bottles and you can get the CL. They've actually been tested by CL, so like the good housekeeping seal of approval. It enables companies of all sizes to have their products voluntarily tested, and that way they get this, this CL seal. In the past seven years, they've tested more than 1,800 products representing 350 different brands and supplements. And one year, 12-month subscription is only $27. So really, it's very inexpensive. And if you're, gonna, if you're into dietary supplements, especially if you have families and patients coming to see you, this is a very nice one because you can look it up very easily. Natural Products Encyclopedia, and there's a freeze newsletter. And the other one I like is the Natural Medicine Database. This, again, is a, has a search method. And again, this one also costs about $30 a year. And it, you enter the natural product names, like echinacea, or you can enter a disease like migraine headaches, or you can do a condition like fibromyalgia or a drug name, and it gives you the objectionable product information, effectiveness, ratings, and potential interactions even with conventional medicine. So this is a very nice one that you can actually search in a lot of different ways to give you a lot of good information. The Natural Product Effectiveness Checker tells you the level of effectiveness for natural products, so it has a gradation from A to D. This one, the A, it has a lot of history behind it, it has a lot of research behind it, it looks to be very safe and very efficacious, all the way to D, maybe it's not even that safe. And then C, with a lot of, or like in the middle, we don't have much about it. It has a natural product drug interaction checker, tells you potential interactions between any natural product and any drug, which is very important because people are always mixing and matching all this stuff. You have no idea what's going to interact and not interact. The disease medical condition search, which shows you the medical condition and allows you to see which natural products might be effective. So you can see, it'll actually see if you, here's a Western one, here's an Ayurvedic one, here's a mix of Chinese ones from traditional Chinese medicine, so you can kind of get a mix as to all the different ways that you can approach a certain condition looking at dietary supplements. And it actually can search colleague interaction, shows you questions, answers, and comments posted by other health professionals. So you can say, like, well, I tried this in my patient and they had this kind of reaction. And uh, colloidal silver is one of my favorite ones. You know, colloidal silver is this thing that you, people consider to be a, a natural antibiotic, and you can, you can actually make it yourself. And if you take it, it's supposed to cure, I think, I think when the last time I looked on, online, it could cure like a thousand different diseases. The thing is, if you take it too long or you take too much of it, it actually causes you to have permanent discoloration of your hands and your skin. It actually, the silver gets out into your, into your hands, into your skin, so it's always there. And there are some, there are some families in some uh, parts of the United States where everybody looks kind of blue, because they all have this colloidal silver that's in the, into their bodies that never can go out of them. So again, it can be, and we had a, a written up a case a couple years ago in a cystic fibrosis patient in Denver who thought that would really be the new approach to treating their chronic uh, lung, pro lung infection, and they got all this, uh, this uh, uh, colloidal silver uh, involvement. There are also supplements and books out there. The ABC Clinical Guide to Herbs by Blumenthal. Again, it's a very good book. Blumenthal is kind of the name in natural products. Contraindication and Drug Interaction by Francis Brinker. He's at the University of Arizona. He's a naturopath. He's very good. Uh, Integrative Medicine by Dave Rakel. Integrative Pediatrics by Tim Colbert and, and, and Olness. Uh, she's in Cleveland and Tim Colbert is in Minnesota. Then there's the Journals of Herbal Pharmacology, the Journal of Alternative Complement Medicine, Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine and evidence-based complementary of medicine. These are all very nice journals, and, I, and we can get almost all these now on Lane here at uh, Stanford. So I just going to give you a quick example of a couple of things we might see for cystic fibrosis. These are all, these are just, a, just a, a smidgen of all the ones I've heard about in the last five years. And again, you can see that people use probiotics, B-complex, all the different vitamins. And again, vitamins is like a funny mix. It's like, it could be just fine, but if you're taking high doses of vitamins, like mega vitamins, then it becomes a little bit different. All these different uh, ginkgo, garlic, ginger, echinacea, essential oils, inhalation. We we, sometimes the inhalation of different essential oils can be very powerful. 
uh, lipoic acid, especially for cystic fibrosis related diabetes. And actually, lipoic acid is actually used by a lot of endocrinologists right now for even standard, uh, especially if you have uh, any type of, uh, of uh, 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 neurological uh, s side effects from your diabetes. Milk thistle to help protect your liver. liver. Grape seed, seed extract, baker's cheese, green tea, airborne. Everybody knows about airborne, right? And, you, know, you get that before you get on the airplane. It's, all, it's a mixture. It's not just homeopathic. It's got some homeopathic. It's got some Chinese medicine. It's got some Ayurvedic medicine. It's got some vitamins in it. And people swear by airborne. You know, I get airborne and never get sick on the airplane. Coenzyme Q10, which again, for, for cardiology, for heart strength, again, that's, that's one that's almost not considered alternative anymore. A lot of cardiologists now use it for their patients. And then all these ones, are, most of these have to do with are very strong uh, antioxidants. A ginseng, licorice, a boswellia, these are uh, ones that are from, uh, from the uh, Ayurvedic in India. And pycnogenol, there was just a Cochrane review on uh, pycnogenol because it's really been promoted for asthma, all kinds of chronic conditions. So it's one that's been very popular and it actually has to do with a, a French white pine bark is where the pycnogenol comes from. Yeah, I just want to put the one study that was done uh, just two years ago in pulmonology looking at probiotics and cystic fibrosis. And we found out that studies of fecal calprotein concentration and rectal nitro oxide have been found to be increased, suggesting a constant intestinal inflammatory. So your gut is really full of a lot of inflammation. So people feel like if you can just decrease the inflammation in your gut, you can actually promote health elsewhere, including your lungs. And so probiotics have live bacteria that you give orally. It's to decrease the severity of gastroenteritis and prevent atopic diseases in children. And the mechanism may be through the improvement of the intestinal barrier function through modification of immune responses. So we know that children who are born by cesarean section, they don't get that same vaginal flora. They have sometimes, or they had a lot of antibiotics in the first year of life. Those children sometimes go on to have more lung problems. So this whole idea of really getting the right proper type of bugs in your gut from the very early on can actually be very, very powerful. So they did 10 CAF patients with mild to moderate lung disease and pseudomonas colonization were treated with uh, lactobacillus GG, which is one of the most common probiotics that are used. And the PFTs didn't change. There wasn't really a change in sputum, but they did find a reduction in pulmonary exacerbation rates, which means they got sick less often and had to come into the hospital. And this is just a, a cartoon to show you about what people think. You have all these pathogens and allergens coming into your lung, and if you have all this stuff in your gut that helps you with this probiotic, it actually blocks all these inflammatory responses. So again, this is from CHEST, which is one of the more traditional uh, conventional therapy, uh, 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 journals for uh, uh, pulmonary physicians, and they have a whole thing, a whole uh, article just on uh, probiotics and lung health. And then here's some dietary supplements for asthma and allergies you can just see. Again, here's uh, butterbur, pycnogenol, vitamin C, magnesium, and the ones that are in blue are all the ones that actually have some studies. Mei Wong or ephedrine is one that's been off the market now for the last few years, although you can still get it on the internet. It's a, that's because people were mixing it with caffeine and other dietary supplements. And that's when all these athletes were having all these seizures and heart disease because they were taking high doses and then going out and trying to overexercise. But it used to be it was a very easy one to use for children with very mild bronchospasm. They had one that was called Breathe Easy Tea that we used to use a lot. And it was for children that just got a little bit of wheeze when they had a little bit of a viral illness. But it, the people really overused it, so they took it off the market. So here's just some other ones too for, for, uh, for allergies. You can see that there's all these different ones out there and every day people ask me about one that I've never heard of. So there's so many dietary supplements out there. So let's move into this next uh, group which I like the most, which is kind of your mind-body. So these guys are all meditating. You can see even this guy, he's got the, he got the, got the legs going here. So mind-body therapies are a cognitive behavioral therapies encompasses several approaches. Relaxation, breathing, biofeedback, hypnosis, and guided imagery. And in fact, these are ones that are almost considered to be, have so much evidence behind them anymore, they're almost not considered to be complementary alternatives. Although there's still people who feel like they just make you feel better, but they don't really do anything for you. They just make you feel like you don't have disease, or they make you feel like you don't have lung problems. But actually, they, there's some studies now showing that they actually decrease the inflammatory response in all different uh, types of situations, including inflammatory bowel disease, arthritis, and even asthma. The theory is based on decreasing the inflammatory process that can be triggered by autonomic nervous system through strong emotions. And if you think about it, asthma back in the 60s and 50s used to be considered to be a psychiatric disease because kids would get so anxious, adults get so anxious with it, they actually used to treat it with phenobarbital to try to sedate people. And they found that they got better. But well, it's probably because they reduced the anxiety, there was a very strong autonomic component to it, and actually it could enhance bronchodilatation. So I'm not saying you should sedate your patients with asthma who are having a reaction or have an asthma attack. But again, if you can calm them down, you can have them do relaxation, if you can have them do belly breathing, you can actually break a lot of people who have respiratory issues. Stress has been associated with higher morbidity and cytokine levels attributed to airway inflammation. 
And now they're even doing studies in, in uh, preterm babies and mothers and having to give them, uh, looking at their stress level and find that the kids that have, the mothers who have more stress even prenatally and, and postnatally, their children have more problems with, uh, with uh, inflammatory uh, diseases. In addition to anxiety, stress is shown to influence the immune response and promote increased sympathetic activity, promote airway inflammation without overt symptoms. And the study I remember that is that we have, uh, they had a, a group of uh, patients with moderate asthma who are college students and they did induced sputums on them. And, and even though they were having normal lung function, they were having no symptoms at all, on their induced sputums during times of finals and midterms, they actually showed they have an inflammatory response in their sputum. Even just the stress showed that they had more inflammation in the lungs, even though they had no overt signs, their lung function didn't change at all, and they had no uh, wheezing or cough. So self-hypnosis, breathing exercises, including yoga, relaxation with or without guided imagery have all been studied. In imagery and self-hypnosis have been shown to decrease shortness of breath and asthma and abdominal pain in children with recurrent abdominal pain. And often these services are available in most communities. Actually, anybody in this room can be taught how to do imagery, taught how to do hypnosis, taught about how to do relaxation. And it's very easy to do. In some services, it's a social worker, sometimes it's a nurse, sometimes it's a doctor, sometimes it's the MA, sometimes it's a respiratory therapist. Almost anybody in a medical situation can be, be taught how to do some of these mind-body relaxation techniques. And breathing exercises may also help, especially breathing using in yoga and martial arts. And that's one of the ones I like to use for the little boys, especially, you know, they all want to take kung fu or karate, and it's actually very good for them because it really teaches them control and really how to use all their lungs. And it, it tends to be very disciplined. So there is a pilot study of mind-body changes in adults and asthma with no with no, who practice mental imagery. That was in 2004. There's effective self-hypnosis on hay fever symptoms in 2005. Hypnosis of asthma, a critical review in 2000. Again, these are all positive studies showing that all these work in all these different areas of lung disease. Biofeedback interventions where you look at heart rate variability and abdominal breathing and uh, heart rate variability alone, placebo EEG feedback and weight control in 94 adults with stable asthma. Medications were titrated following the symptoms, lung function, and peak flow meters were monitored. And the ones that had the high rate variability groups were giving less medication, decrease in severity, improved lung function, and they all got better just using biofeedback. So it's a very powerful one for, for children and adults who have uh, respiratory symptoms. So behavioral interventions in asthma, such as biofeedback, overall the evidence was uh, uh, as an objective treatment asthma it is meager, but they only reviewed 12 studies. So what, are, what is progressive relaxation and guided imagery? So I just kind of walk you through what I, what I used as my kids when I did a study down at the University of Arizona. We took uh, children that had mild to moderate uh, asthma that were on medications that were stable, had normal lung function tests. And we introduced the, the goals and techniques. We stressed the importance of practicing, modeled the practice techniques. We identified their sensations with that relaxation, such as warmth and tingly feelings. We identified relaxation as a positive feeling, and we introduced this to guide their asthma reduction imagery. So what you do, is anybody ever done re, uh, guided imagery relaxation? So again, you can see that uh, you tell a child that it's going to consist of learning to tense and relax various groups of the body. So they tense them up and then they relax them. You can move top to bottom, you can do all different ways, but usually you start at the top and you move them all the way down. And you go through, while well, at the same time, you pay very close and careful attention to the feeling associated with both tension and relaxation. Because when they get an asthma attack or they have some type of problem with their breathing or pain, you want to associate that with a certain feeling. So sometimes that's that tense feeling. So they get an image with what that seems when you have the tense feeling. And then when they relax it, they get another image, what that image is when they have the relaxed feeling. Mm -hmm. And so it's very vivid. And kids are great. If I wanted to do it for you guys in this room, I'd have to turn down the lights. I'd have to have you all sit up. You'd all have to, you know, close your eyes and put your in, start taking nice deep breaths and start to think about and try to clear your mind of all the other crap that's going on there. But kids, you can say, okay, I want you to relax. Okay. <laughs> I want you to have an image when you, when you think about something. Okay. I mean, they're just like right there. They can just go right there. You can just do imagery so fast with children because their mind is already there. We beat it out of them. We say, quit daydreaming, you know, pay attention, you know, get back here, look at your son, you know. And, but, you know, we kind of beat it out of kids by the time that they get to be in junior high, high school, or college. But little kids, especially, you know, 8, 9, 10, 12 year olds, they can go right there right away. They just like, okay, I'm right there. And you start off by running through each muscle group and modeling for each child how to tense and relax. And you practice this tensing and releasing twice. After each tension and relaxation, you ask the child what it feels like. And it's important for them to tell you what they feel like. You don't want to put too many images in their mind. You don't want to tell them, oh, you feel like it's uh, something that, that's, they may not like that image. And so you don't want to be very careful when you try to do imagery. You want to make sure you use the image of what the child or the, or the young adult is using. And then you want, to, you want to know what that's like when they're relaxing. And then you tell the child that while his body remains relaxed, you're going to ask him to do some imaging. 
and you asked him the last time he had a tickle in the throat or felt like he was going to have trouble breathing, and try to imagine what that would look like. And you get all kinds of ideas what they might come up with. I mean, it's really amazing what they'll come up with. And sometimes it's stuff that makes sense, sometimes it makes no sense at all, but it doesn't matter because that's their image for whatever they're having. And then you ask the child to describe what discomfort's like. Is it tight? Is it heavy? Is it cold? Is it tickle? And you really try to get them to use all their senses. Do they feel something on their face? Do they feel something on their skin? Do they smell something? Do they hear something? You really try to use all their senses. And they really get into it. They really say, oh, yeah, I do this. And they're really telling you about all this stuff. And I had this little girl that had migraines. And she was telling me how it was like a rose. And she could smell it. And the smell would go away. And it would get really tight. And it would really like close up all the way. And, she would, and, the, the, and the thorns would get bigger. I mean, she really got into this whole thing about what the rose was doing when she really had this migraine headache of hers. Then you had to imagine what the death might look like or come up with a mental picture of what the pain could be like. If they're having difficulty breathing, you can give examples like a block of ice in the throat, but I don't even do that really. I like to just let them do their own imagery. And then you reinforce the description and encourage the child to elaborate on details and clarify, like I said, the colors, the sounds, the embalmment. You really try to get them to go for it. And then you tell the child that the clearer the image is, the more powerful the pain reliever will be. So you really want to get it really specific because then when you make it better, it really gets much better. So you want to make it really specific, and then you want to make what makes it better very specific too. And when the child has a clear image of the discomfort, you ask them, well, get rid of the image. And you can imagine, like for the block of ice or for the rose or whatever, you can imagine the kids would come up very something very quickly with how to make that much better. And you guide the child in describing the second image, including how the second image may make the pain disappear. And you ask the child to imagine the second image to make the first image disappear, and you notice the good feeling that comes with the less discomfort. So you have them go through the whole thing again. How do they feel? What's it smell like? Is it cold? Is it warm? What's the air like? You know, how do they feel? And all these different things you try to put together. And then you do this post-session uh, reinforcement where you reinforce the effort and success. You describe the practice. You tell the child to practice at least twice a day. They should use a rescue inhaler if they have asthma before practicing techniques if the child has breathing difficulties because you don't want to put them into an asthma attack by having a bad feeling about it, right? You don't want to say, oh, I want to practice, but you can't breathe. So if they need to, you even actually take their albuterol inhaler or whatever the rescue is prior to doing their, 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 uh, their uh, relaxation techniques. Do not tell the child to use medications if they need them, especially the exercises. And then you develop a plan with the child about practicing these techniques, and he or she should be in a quiet place and practicing and ask the child where and when he might practice, because they'll come up with all kinds of crazy ideas about when they're going to do it and how they're going to do it. And so some of the images that came up, you, know, you can imagine this is a, a little child that was having problems with the breathing. It was like a fish out of water. I think there was even an advertisement I think I saw on TV last night where this, they have a fish that's like flopping around on the ground and it shows it like, oh, can't breathe. They give them the medication, of course, and they throw it back in the water and it swims away. You know? But you can see if you just do that imaging without the medication, it could also be very effective. You could have flowers and opening up and closing. Uh, this is one that I, these are ones that people have told me about. We had a big fire in Tucson when I was there, and the whole, the whole Catalina Mountains were on fire for about two months. And so one person was telling me about their asthma. They felt like, they were like, their, whole, like their whole chest was burning up. And so that was one of the images they gave. This is like a fireworks uh, display about uh, trying to open up things and get much better. You can see an ice pick in the, in the throat's always a popular one. Darth Vader was very popular for a while, you know. <sighs> The, uh, the elephant, especially on your chest, the giant, the giraffe with the very long neck, these were all very powerful images that kids ca I came up with when I was talking to them. And so that's kind of my talk. This is one that actually I used to put in as a joke, but actually if people seen this, is not a joke. This is one that just came out, uh, that just came out on the market just about a, a month ago. It's AeroShot. You can see it here, it says pure energy, dry energy shot dietary supplement, breathable energy anytime, any place. It's actually caffeine that you <laughs> It's about the size of a, of a, uh, of a uh, lipstick or a, uh, uh, and so the FDA did not let this one get past them. They stopped this one now. They're saying like, well, you're not really supposed to inhale it, but this is actually just on, just came out on the market just in the last couple of weeks. And so it's being stopped by the FDA. So this is one that people kind of, the idea is it's like, well, you don't want to drink your caffeine and we'll just give it into an inhaler, <laughs> take a shot. And it's about the same as a strong cup of coffee. So thanks. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. <laughs>